My name is Leslie Linball, though in the online world I'm known as 1% Yellow. This video was created for Dr. Alec Koros's ECI 831 class and reflects my attempt to become a social artist. Through this project, I hope to connect individuals from my undergraduate university, the Augustana campus of the University of Alberta, with individuals from the University of Mary Washington who are exploring the possibilities for liberal arts education online. The point of contact between these two schools is their mutual membership in the Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges, or COPELAC. In part five of this series, we move on to the University of Mary Washington's next value of liberal arts education, self-directed learning. One has to be very wise in understanding self-directed learning. And the thing is, is self-directed learning itself is something you have to learn. But we had little opportunity to do that when I was an undergraduate. Shut up. Sit down. And, and now it's considered, you know, quite normal. Later on, talk to me. No one talks. Talk to me. No one talks. I'm good at doing what you tell me to do. So it's not just like, oh, wait, you're self-directed. I mean, it's something you have to be, has to be modeled, have to be kind of shown. The self-directing environment should be promoted from the very beginning. And everyone should be contributing to that. The value of self-directed learning really has to do with giving students, empowering students within the class. That no one tells you what the outcome of the course is meant to be. It's, it's that you're giving that space and that room to make the outcomes of the course um, personally meaningful. Uh, the importance for, for students to, to get, to put so, something of themselves in what they learn. There's also a sense in which I, however students do this, I never take it personally. Assignments um, aren't based on um, a corpus that we have to learn. Canon is important, but so is following your own passions. But it's really based on um, what they can do with it, how they can use it, how they can make it their, their, their own. And people do a thousand times more work. They'll go through far more grief when it's something that I decided to do as opposed to being told, you know, that you have to do this. So, yeah, it's more work. <laughs> so, <laughs> But then the, it's the, more work, but it's motivated work. And yeah, I, I could even, I could almost cut down on, on the number of lecture hours and, and put more hours of uh, men, mentorship uh, to help them develop those uh, self-directing uh, skills. Somehow there will be a contract, a formal or informal, and that contract uh, should have important points. There must be um, the aspect of time, when that should be accomplished. Uh, there should be a manner in what format. So that um, the choices are not necessarily all dictated to them, that they're given a certain amount of freedom to explore, um, to choose the path that makes the most sense for them, um, whether that has to do with their learning style, whether or not that has to do with a particular interest in the discipline that they want to explore further. For Sarah Ross, this also means working at her own pace, choosing to take courses when she's able, and being able to fit them into other things that are going on in her life. The ability to, to direct your own learning, to, to have enough flexibility in your program, that, um, and that, that's what I like about how we structured stuff at Augustana, you can sample around a bit and say, you know, you know sure, I'm a chemistry major, but I'm really interested in Eastern religion, so I'm going to go take a course on that. And we really have an opportunity to rethink that at Mary Washington with our freshman seminars because there are a lot about self-directed learning and research from the get-go. Especially in the context of lifetime learning is being able to um, discover interesting questions yourself and having the curiosity to want to explore them without, um, without having the structure of a teacher and an assignment saying, you must do this or else, you know, I will, I will beat you over the head with a grade. The world around you provides the feedback and not the instructor. It is up to me to progress and to get to the end in, in a happy way to make it successful, to make it worth it. Ideally, we want students to, to be able to do that self-directed learning by the time they graduate or else in an important sense we failed as teachers, I think. You know, I think in a sense, uh, I mean, it sounds like a cop-it, but I think it's sort of like active learning. I think there's a sense in which, well, yeah, all it's all self-directed anyways. 
So if a teacher ever thinks that she or he is directing it, they are sadly mistaken. You plant the garden, if you want to use that image, or you scatter seeds, and you don't know what's going to come up and what's not going to come up. And you can do lots of other things, too, about, oh, I think this is a dry patch. We need to water it or, you know, put some compost here or whatever. But you're not the, you're not the one who makes things grow. I think Steve Greenlaw and Janet Wasalius's final comments reveal nicely the tension that is in self-directed learning. On the one hand, we're educators, and we would like to be able to prepare our students and give them practice in honing their self-directed skills. But on the other hand, the philosophy of self-direction really reveals to us that we are not the ones who make things grow. I think that when we reveal this fact and explore it with students, they come to understand how important the individual is in the educational process and begin to nurture what's already inside of them.